This draw along session on architecture takes us to the end of our current series on Western culture in the dawn of the modern movement and the exchange from historicism to rote modernism that we approach with the modern masters in our next series. Today's topic is the Chrysler Building as we move from Chicago to New York as the competition for the infamous race to the sky continues in both cities for world dominance of architectural structural diagramming, as well as the language of architecture as, as it shifts over time. Today we're looking at an Art Deco building, the Chrysler Building on the east side of Manhattan at about 1,050 feet. It's the tallest brick building in the world with a steel framework. And it was the world's tallest building for about 11 months until even more famous building, the Empire State Building eclipsed it in height. So that was part of the local race competing with Chicago, these two towers being in, in New York. Uh, historically then, if you look at the profiles of buildings growing up, and these aren't to scale to each other, they're just printed differently as models. We have the earlier type of neo-Gothic tops like we saw at the Tribune Tower in Chicago. And um, this is the American Radiator, Radiator Building in New York City. It's got the neo-Gothic look. In New York also is Standard Oil, which has got more of a classical idea with a series of temples that rise up. Or something that's leaning toward more of the Art Deco and the streamline of design, just having the actual sort of zoning ordinance kind of profile the building where buildings have to step back away from the street as they rise up. So all these do, but in different fashions in terms of how they're ornamented on the exterior skin. Our focus today on the Chrysler Building will uh, be evidence of the booming Roaring Twenties that saw New York eclipse London as the most populous city in the world. It was fueled by grand real estate investments where people would invest in the city by wealthy and elite speculators. And uh, the, the promise of this the zoning or step back would mean as you start at the base, and so we did sort of a quick sketch over here on the side of the floor plate. In this part of Manhattan, even though it's mostly an orthorhic grid, the backside is trapezoidal. So the building rises up to fulfill that 12 stories and then shifts to have the building carve away on the front and back to let light into the interior rooms as much as possible for more beneficial. And then from there up, it continues only in the central third of the building and then rises up on top of that to have an octagonal movement that joins. And on top of that, a square that settles in that aspect. So it's all very central. And obviously that makes for the importance of these skyscrapers and their development was the importance of Otis elevators and be able to move people in a timely fashion from grade to whatever floor they work on. So what happens then in its length as it moves up off the ground, it basically makes a very tall, thin pyramidal form as it steps back within that. So again, you have the base, that midsection rises up to a certain point, then the bulk of the tower itself, and then more of the finial at the, fin fin at the top. So it kind of steps like this, and that's kind of the nomenclature of all these towers as they rise up so that they create the void in the city street to let light and fresh air into the streets themselves rather than having pure perpendicular canyons. And so that's kind of the scope of what we'll draw today, the series of how the city opens up as it rises. So our view here is going to be, as you see in the photo over the left, it's going to be unusual because typically we're looking at architecture from grade to see the whole mass. But in this case, we've lifted up, we're actually photographing the, the Chrysler building from another tower. And so in order to find that horizon line, the key is to go to one of the levels of fenestration here, the windows that are facing south here, and look at the absolute line of windows that match the edge of the photograph, which means if that's a horizontal and that's a horizontal, we found our horizon line. So draw that across here. 
And then we'll know our two vanishing points have to be on that line. And now at the top, the tick mark show that it rushes down here to the right. So the right point is closer. We can use the base of the building then here, or even a, something across the street to rush back to this point to find that on the right side. And at the top of the building, right where it makes its last break to its finial, it's shooting off here past the photograph off the paper to a point further down, maybe two or three inches off the piece of paper. So left and vanishing points, left and right have raised up. So as we rise up in the building across downtown to look at the tower, uh, the horizon line goes with us. It's not looking down to find it. It's not looking up to find it. It literally is where our eye height is. So let's go ahead and box out the framework here. Here's the back edge of the tower as it runs down and it starts to step out a bit. We finally find its edge point that takes it down to the grade. Here's the shade side. We'll be putting it in later. It marches down, finds its corner, and then continues down. The sun side, the side of the spire up top and its Art Deco form. And Art Deco really takes off sort of a, almost like an in-between interstitial period of maybe 20, 25 years where they're moving away from the rote historicism of classical language or the Gothic ideal on these tired skyscrapers as they rise from the ground and touch the sky. Uh, and so this is something that's a little bit more machined and kind of takes after some of the products that are seen around the same time as industrialization comes to its fruition. So a lot of products that are about movement or about industrial design or the new metals that are used to skin the objects. So for instance, steamships or airplanes had more... Um, motion-oriented form makes to them. So the Art Deco picks up on that and creates sort of its own style within that period before that also drops away. We start to see just sort of the rote idea of the minimalist of the modern mover later, later on. So here at the top is the crenellation that reminds you of some of the Chrysler motor cars at the time and the movement and the spectacle as this drives up almost seems like it could be parts of the symbols of the hood ornaments installed on Chrysler vehicles. The winged helmet you'd find on the front on top of the engine itself seems to be part of this project too. Initially, it was planned to be um, uh, entrepreneurial endeavor by William Reynolds, who was a former New York State Senator. And then he lost funding for it. So he sold the design to Mr. Chrysler, Walter P. Chrysler, who was the visionary creator of the famed auto manufacturer. And so you wanted to re, uh, the top of it to resemble that car engine's radiator. So it's kind of a, a billboard as well as an office structure. Now I'll come down on the sun side here and, and that's where we'll break with the sky. And then we'll see neighboring buildings in the distance next to it. So we'll have a little gap between there and the edge of the neighboring building. And it steps on its way back down to terra firma in this part of downtown Manhattan. So the rest of the buildings, the backdrop, are just uh, sequentially neighbors. And so since they're not subject matters, we'll leave them sort of unadorned, but we'll start to strike in some of the heights of the buildings and what they're doing in terms of just support. It's a support cast for this, because even to this day, it has its, its own throne as being the highest building in its own neighborhood. But then just down the road is the Empire State, for instance, and then uh, the New World Trade Center is over to the left of that. And so we're just drawing in the rest of Manhattan here to give scale to the neighborhood itself. So we've got some in the foreground and some in the background. And we finally come down to the base here. We won't quite see it hit the street, but right down here we see the canopy for the street. So we get to that edge at the bottom of the paper. And now coming back here is it's this is the primary address and around the corner then is the secondary street that's located on. And that'll go back along that boulevard, this being the closest thing we have to a street going back in perspective. And so we'll infill this as value allows us later on. And now we'll simply march into the building itself and try to create uh, something as simple as possible to give us the idea of 
of the strength of this tower as it pushes pushes towards the skies. So there's our 20%. Let's look at the 30 for a while and start to allocate how we're going to do our value system. So we'll start from the top to the bottom. And we know on the far right side, the final top spire here over toward the right will be the arcane of those stainless steel systems up here. There's setbacks on the 16th floor, the 18th, the 23rd, the 28th, and 31st as it rises up again along this U-shaped plan, which opens up on the base. And so at the bottom, it kind of crenellates as angers at the corners, but there's allowing the natural light to pervade deeper into the building. And those are legally mandated setbacks um, that are influenced by uh, the topography of just the movement of air and light in downtown Manhattan. So we'll have the dark side over here as the tower rises up. And then this whole far side on the right, as it goes back in space. And we'll come back in detail a little bit with darks within the darks to show its depth there. It is from its front entry. You can see here that it's rectangular in plan. There are more bays in the primary facade and less in the secondary. So that doesn't go as deep as this is wide. So that's the view we're looking at here from the distance kind of tilted like that. And as it steps down, again, the top of all the horizontals will project back to our vanishing point there. So this one comes over to about here. See that dark edge. And then this full side down to the corner then, adjacent to this dark building over next, next to it, will create sort of a, a shadow cast canyon in the street a little bit once we get to the higher value markers. So that sets up the building on the street. And so now we can go to all of its cast of characters that are in the neighborhood here and do the same to their right sides. And we'll, we'll really hold that little spot between this building and that and make sure that's very important white that separates those two and pushes this one back in the distance. And now I see inside of that tower, I need this one. And as we separate away, we'll show less and less detail in the neighboring buildings. Now the distance will be less of a subject, so we'll gray it out but the contrast to its right side is important to us. So we keep step staggering these towers, they move back in space. And those will come down to grade here. Small tower, very long, thin one of the distance, much more contemporary to this. It might even approach the height of the Chrysler. It's only gonna to come to this point, you see the top of it meets the top here. So those are the same size forms up to this point. Chrysler appears so much larger because it's closer to the foreground. And then we've got uh, our neighboring building here, which is in light, but it is a darker tone brick building. So we'll simply wash that out. And as this gets darker later, this will become more prominent for us. And in the foreground, we'll have a smaller, looks like an ecclesiastical building at the corner here. Stepping down the street grade and a bit of the base. So we'll show it coming down and having this, this flat part of the earth here is very important to us to establish grade. So where all is what weight carried by. And now our one foreground that sets this up for us and then proceeds back to our vanishing point over here. It's got the presence of the right side, which is sort of formally decorative and interesting for the city. On the back side, we're seeing the inside of it. So it's got it's U-shape, which allows for things to happen as it opens up towards its less public side of it. We'll use that as a reference just as a base. And do the same thing for the one adjacent to it, as there's another street on this side of the Chrysler building. So that one steps back, and here's the formal sign, which will receive a dark. And then here's the 
backside, which does things to get more propriety into the building itself. So the light and the air movement on the backside of the buildings. And then we'll have that kind of fade out here to the left towards the left vanishing point, because obviously the stills are subject. Uh, our neighbor to the left here steps down and then rushes down and over adjacent to it is also a stepping building, which comes down and is met by a couple of smaller buildings on either side, which make up part of the neighborhood. There's a little small building at the base here. And again, insignificant in terms of the amount of detail we put on to it, but just to suggest the idea of density in this part of Manhattan. And that'll kind of go off to the edge there. And now we'll do the same on the right side. Once we get past this primary building here, right behind it, there is a um, tower or two to the right. So it passes on its base. We'll wash that out to number three for now. Lighter clad tower adjacent to that. And then shorter buildings in the foreground. If we see the tops and they've got horizontal lines, they'll always vanish back to that right vanishing point. And that'll come down, edge of that ecclesiastical building here and actually an open parking lot on this point. So it's just a matter of sort of gamesmanship now to keep using left, right vantage point, left vantage point to kind of build out an abstraction of the city now and not the detail of the actual architecture. Now we'll come back with light, shade, and shadow as it comes closer to our subject. As we move through three through nine, we'll make it bolder and bolder. So let's go back to two really quick and make sure we do um, the representation of the sky. It's going to help pull the tower off the backdrop because now it's white on white. We need to have it to be white on a dark tone back there. So because it's marker and doesn't do a great clean wash because of our strokes, we'll put in a little bit of cloud cover here rather than it, like we'll accentuate the clouds there. And we'll move those into patterns. So they're not flat here. Move more on a diagonal. So if I just shift this out of the way just for a second. So I can start on this side of the tower. We'll take the two and just kind of structure and where you want to pull those lines. A bit of a diagonal. Like that and have them kind of collapse tighter to themselves. Maybe a big broad one up here at the top. And then in the distance. So they're all equally distance from each other but they're going back and getting tighter because they're miles away by the time you get to this point. So we can go ahead and take where we want to do some of our dynamic of the wash and kind of feather a 20% in right adjacent to the building with the broad end. Do the same up above. And carry that right through to the back side. And then maybe just the bottom side of the ones that are further in the distance. Get maybe the underside of the ones we just did a little bit darker. Jason to it. So that'll help kind of pull that off that back page and get the sense of the top plate also being horizontal like we're trying to articulate the base here as well. And then our vertical kind of connects the two as our building scrapes the sky, hence skyscraper. Okay, move up to four now. We'll start to assess some of our language for all the sort of uh, intensity of the levels of windows that come through here. So I think we want to do is establish that there are uh, major vertical elements that drive up that make this thing have more of an essence of projecting toward the sky. So we'll start with the middle three, one, two, and three, and make sure they're kind of established here with the four. And then we'll step out a little bit here as they come down further. We don't have to be sort of 
exact all the way through, but at least it establishes we have to remember they're there and hold on to that, that great vertical throw of those three stripings. One, two, and three, all the way down to the top of that anchor piece. And, down. and then on the end, there's a bit of a change that these have a vertical thrust and these are have horizontality to sort of the edges. So holding the vertical throw in the center are more horizontal aspects. So we can bend, begin to kind of like tick those out along the way. Again, we're not gonna be wholly accurate to the exact number, but just get the idea moving. And then continue that throw to the main one in the center which drives up here and then starts the sort of circular banding of the crenellation up top, which is the sort of iconic image of the Chrysler as it moves up. And then along that are these splayed ideas of almost sunbursts. And those are fenestrations so we can make them a little bit darker within sort of the, the radial grid in their triangulated form. Just an essence of them because we're so far away, I don't see a whole lot of the detail, but that's enough to kind of start that up. And we'll come back on this end of the movement of this piece, and we'll see that it casts a shadow on this end of it, and then a stronger shadow on the right side. And we'll hold on to this edge, and it steps down on little Art Deco detailing to hold onto the block beneath it. And now with four, we can start to hit this edge. The same type of aspect wraps around the side of it, but it's all in shade, so we lose that detail. On the edge for now, we'll, we'll keep green value under the side as we march down. On that piece, this piece brings us right up to our eye level on the edge of the building. There's a little bit of deck here on the final piece that comes down. And because we're getting very close to us on this corner, we could hint at the windows on the edge here sort of wrapping around and showing a little bit of tension kind of going back in perspective here. So carrying this down again towards us, we'll keep that activity towards the base. And there's a change in the formwork right by our horizon line. And then we see a break between the two sort of shoulders for the building at the base. They create a shadow line on this edge of the architecture. So right here, you know, at that point coming down, there's a nice break then as we see the sun leave a nice shade area to make that a little bit of a U-shaped indentation, which pulls this edge up closer to us and then casts a bit of a shadow down here. And then we can articulate some of the movement of the horizontal in that space too. Okay, and now we'll wash that four along our neighboring buildings. Make that against the sky in the backdrop. Show a little more detail of the final edge conditions of these buildings as they step back. This is the one that kind of ziggurats back. So this whole side will be darker. This whole side will be darker. And it appears that even at this point, as the light comes down from this left side, it's not only keeping this all in shade, but it's going to throw a shadow and completely ensconce these neighboring buildings. 
right behind our frontal brick. So this receives some of the sunlight here, but it actually casts a shadow down on this part of it. And then behind it, the entire neighboring building down to the grade. So you can see that the light not only lights this up, but then throws the Chrysler buildings cast shadow on the neighboring towers that's picked up there. Then here further in the distance, it's just another deco building in the distance that we can kind of hint at. But again, it's so far away, we don't want to make it part of the subject. And then real tertiary buildings off to the side here. And so right when we get past this middle third and get to this outside edge, we're pretty much done with the sketch because we don't want to detail out too much in their horizontal and pull away from the subject. So this is the really key aspect here. We want to make sure that that edge for this area on its neighbor on this side holds a strong value. Then comes the edge of that. So you've got that little white crease between the buildings that hold space so that there's air all the way around that. We don't want to have this layover on the building adjacent to it. And this one down. It also has a stepped out section here so that'll cast a shadow. And now we're going to have a stronger edge on our front of the Chrysler. We'll come back and pull this out. And then I'll have the twin of these arches on the opposite side making their wrap because they they have this RK that diminishes towards the top on all four profiles wrapping around it. So to number five, and that'll kind of finish off in terms of our elaboration. That's a matter of going from six to nine in terms of hitting all the hot spots of the depth of our value. So top to bottom again, come back into the display of these little windows. And wrap around each floor. We're going to show a little bit of activity in some of the windows coming down to edge them. The key throw for the five to hold us toward six to nine later on is from the final corner where it hits 
the street level here and then goes back in the angle of the sun inclination and then that throws the shadow on the whole street level down here. And that'll run up and tie up to the cast shadow that's being thrown on the building as well. And sort of lets this end up being a bit brighter than the cast shadow. So we've got a range of value just at the corner here, which will seat the building down on the ground better. And then over its foot level here, we'll see some of the entry points down here at grade level. And then we'll rush the corner from Page White right to this corner because here's the major street out in front that runs left to right on us here. And we want to pull that edge of these front buildings away from that drop down to the street. So now six, seven, and eight will simply go through the exact same process as we do with five and keep hierarchically getting deeper with value. We'll start top to bottom. Little pointed areas up here. And the same dark that we have for the shade side of the towers in this part of Manhattan on the right side here, that'll diminish as you go back. So that value, even though it's just as strong in reality, diminishes away from your content area. So we'll pick up this corner. It's really important to make the turn on the building. And that dissipate a bit towards its back. We'll pick it up a bit. Number seven, we we'll get the portion of way to black eventually. Now take seven down to that alley area, the side street.
And in the closing minutes, just repeat the process with eight and nine. So top to bottom with eight. Some more definition with the fenestration. Maybe some of the cup of the radiating triangles up top. As we get these last little glimpses, it's probably a total of a square inch of number eight on the entire piece of paper, but it really then starts to pull out the whites we've left behind. There are little gargoyles that project out. Up here, they'll see the silhouettes flying out of the space. And then finally, chasing down some of the eights with nine. And now we do sort of a, a global check of all of our values, maybe stepping back to number two again, and then washing the sky right up to the base of the tower. Kind of blurring the lines of the strokes from the floor. Make those clouds a little bit tighter to the tower proper. You can probably just interject some more of a real sketchy type of Manhattan either side here now where the diminishes off on the sides. Maybe take our neighbor and gray him out a bit next to our subject. A little more value right to the edges of it.
We'll take the three as well, then wash out a little bit of the buildings too. And the chisel point side. So there we are in east side of Manhattan, 1930, just completed before the Great Depression set in, the Chrysler Building.